Okay, we are Fable Game HK, and I'm Terry. And today we are so happy to invite uh, Pro Tour Top Eight with Kano, uh, Shasha, and welcome you. Hey, hey, hello! Thank you for having me. Yeah, 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 we are so glad to have you to uh, have an interview to show uh, the rest of the world how uh, using Kano to uh, in the Pro Tour and get a very good results. And congratulations to Sasha. Thank you again. It was a lot of fun. Like, uh, I'm not sure if people have played much Kano, but I recommend it. It's really fun. Yeah, and the rest of the world will uh, respect uh, us as a Kano player to bring AB from now on. That's right. They, they better not forget it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have an uh, interview with uh, Shasha to uh, show us how to uh, play Kano and uh, how to be a better Kano player. And we can show the combo line with Shasha how to do a big combo with over 20 or 30 damage in one turn. And I think uh, all of my viewers uh, must be a better Kano and also uh, it's better how to deal with Kano. So uh, maybe start with uh, uh, Shasha, uh, what do you think on the advantage of Kano in the current matter? So Kano is a very unique deck in that it can play on both of the players' turns. So the one key advantage that Kano has is that he can kill their opponent while they're trying to kill you. That, mm -hmm. that is the reason to play Kano or to play Wizard in general, mm -hmm. is that all your cards on your turn are much weaker than all their cards on their turn, but then there's that little dance of uh, they can't do their most powerful things because if they do, they're probably dead. So that, that's the most uh, fun thing about Kano. It just changes how the game is played entirely, and I think that's really cool. Yeah. This is the, uh, the magic and uh, why this is. I'm so obsessed in uh, playing Kano. I can kill you in your turn. All the turn is that's our it. turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. Okay, Shasha, can you uh, have an intro for your deck uh, about the, uh, the deck build how many reds, how many yellow or blue? And what's yep. the cards used for? Absolutely, my pleasure. So as you can see here, there aren't that many red cards compared to your typical Kano deck. Yeah. There's quite a lot of blues and a sprinkle of yellows. And all the yellows are very important and we'll get to those in a second. Mm -hmm. So the red cards, it's quite distinctly a combo deck. Ether Wildfire is the most important card in the deck, and uh, it's hiding behind the Vaulted Bolt there. Uh, without Ether Wildfire, uh, the deck doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to try to find that card as much as possible. The other red cards, Ether Spindle and Vaulted Bolt, they're our biggest and cheapest versions to do a lot of chip damage. And also mm -hmm. Ether Spindle can combo on itself as well if you follow it for Wildfire. I'm not sure if you've ever done it, but if you get to opt for 11, it feels pretty yeah. good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sure. if, if there is Tom here and there's a Blazing here and you can just uh, sequencing your deck in in your own way. Yeah, you can do some crazy things. Uh, you're the master of the universe at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and then there's Blazing Ether, which is pretty much always going to be used to put the nail in the coffin and mm -hmm. be the kill spell. So mm. that guy is very important as well. Yeah, more than 14 or 20 damage, just one super cost spell. Yep, pretty cheap, pretty efficient. Yeah. Uh, it's a specialization for a reason. It's, <laughs> it's perfect for Kano. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the Wildfire is just for the setup for the uh, big combo. And the uh, Spindle and the Voltic Bow is for the chip damage. And Tom will have uh, extra resources and... Uh, extra luck how to high roll your yeah. opponent yeah and the blazing is for the uh finisher combo piece okay Correct. and i can see uh the the yellow cards the the tom tom of yando and yep. some some kind of player just don't like this card because uh it cannot play from uh following by the uh sonic boom but uh and also uh if you uh, opt the top cards for the Tom Fiendo, you need uh, three resources and play the card with one resources. And you just draw two cards. If uh, you draw two blues, you get the extra resources for, for two. 
But if there is a red card and even words is uh, maybe one yellow, one red, or two reds, then you are lo losing the tempos here. So uh, why will you choose the, the Tom or will you just have a thought of sign in or sign out? So Tom of Fiendal and Tom of Etherwind uh, play very important roles, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because the more cards that you see, uh, the faster you get to kill them. So uh, you pretty much just need to find Ether Wildfire as quickly as possible, and then the game really starts and pretty much ends for your opponent. So Tom of um, Fiendal helps you high roll a little bit. It can gain you some life so you survive longer, so you can actually see more cards. Um, they also pair very, very powerfully with Ether Spindle. Um, so sometimes you don't need the full combo. You can just go half combo, wildfire into Ether Spindle. And like you just mentioned earlier, you find all the tomes and you sequence it perfectly, and that's all you need. Um, so yeah, uh, Tomi Fiendal uh, pretty much helps you just see the cards faster. Okay. And in some points, uh, is it because your deck book is have many blues? So it's more much better to work with the Tom Fiendo instead of the, the normal uh, typical uh, Kano deck with uh, as less as blue they can to increase their uh, damage or increase the red card you you doing the Kano stuff in the top. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Tom is better in this deck compared to regular Kano decks with a lot more reds. It's because you're more likely to get the blues to get your resources. And also the chip damage isn't as necessary to do as much. Like, all you really need to do is one Vaultic Bolt, and that's enough chip damage to win the game. Sometimes you don't even need to do a full Vaultic Bolt. But, nice. uh, yeah. I understand. And besides of that, uh, Sonic Boom, is, is it important as the uh, normal play for chip damage or for the big turn or just a, a okay card in the deck? Um, it, it's pretty okay. Like, if I had to cut a deck, uh, a card from the deck, I'd probably cut Sonic Boom, to be honest. Uh -huh. um, it, it's more of a, a distraction and more of a win more card. Um, Sonic Boom acts like a Vaultic Bolt in that it does some chip damage, but it also has a on hit effect where if you do pair into like an Arcane Barrier opponent or an opponent with Spell Void, it tempts them into um, using it. Uh, at the Pro Tour, no one really knew how our deck worked. Uh, a lot of our opponents had to read the cards. And when they see a card like Sonic Boom, um, the few opponents that I played that did have Spell Void would usually Spell Void the Sonic Boom, which uh -huh. is the best thing that I could ask for. I'll do that every single day of the week. But uh, yeah, so Sonic Boom is just okay in this deck compared to other Kano decks where it's like the card you want to play the most. I see. But in my mind, uh, Sonic Boom, you you gain an extra uh, extra cards to play, just like you you have a free op for the free resources, and maybe you just do one damage, and you can free for uh, to reduce one resources. So that means if there's a hit on the Sonic Bomb, there's a, a cost of four resources. So Sims is very good, but in your in your deck build, uh, this card is not as valuable as others, right? Yeah, not as valuable as others. It has a little bit of benefit because it's kind of like an opt one, so you get to see more cards a little bit faster, but it's not the reason that I play it. I see. Like, uh, a card that you could compare it to is Red Ether Flare, but the reason that we chose Sonic Boom is just because it's yellow. Uh, you just want as many resources as possible on the on the turns that you kill them. I see. And nevertheless... Is that the most one of the most important card in the deck? Is the lesson in lover? Yes, absolutely. I think besides um, Ether Wildfire, I think lesson in lava is the most important card in, in the deck. Mm -hmm. It does every job that you want at every point of the game. If you need to do chip damage, it does chip damage. If you need to find a combo piece, it finds a combo piece. Uh, if you need resources, it's not a red. Like a yellow is not the best, but. <laughs> Some I would have loved the yellow in the top eight, but uh, that's that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It just yeah, does yeah, every job good. possible. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So after the yellow cards, you running uh, besides of the sideboard of the scour the the blue cards. Uh, how many blue you running in your deck? So in my main configured deck of sixty cards, thirty six of them are usually blue. Thirty six, more than a half. Thirty six. 
More than half. Oh, I see. Is it uh is this work for uh the uh the, the combo uh the big combo at the end need a a higher chance to uh get a blue card from the uh the uh Raga Muffin hat? Yep, uh that is uh the main priority is that when you rag a muffin's hat, mm-hmm. you just want to see as many resources as possible. Each yep. resource that you draw can be five, seven more damage for each resource. It, it can really um, scale up quite dramatically. So anything to increase those odds uh, is very, very good because we don't chip damage like a normal Kenna deck. We don't need to get them to 22 or 18. I just need to get them down to 34. If that, if, if, if that the opponent is no AB. No uh, any ready. AB. Any AB. Ah. 34 is enough. 34 is enough. Okay, we are looking for in the uh the combo line you showing to us. Okay, is there any blue cards you uh shout out for the uh big road in the deck? Absolutely. Uh energy potion is probably my favorite card in Flesh and Blood, and especially in this deck. If you get to start out with an early energy potion, mm-hmm. uh, I think your chances of winning skyrocket. It's just almost impossible to lose in uh a opponent that isn't running any ab at all whenever an opponent runs ab it's more of a dance more of a game nothing's guaranteed but uh against a, an opponent with no ab then it's pretty much guaranteed mm-hmm. uh in 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 some points you have uh the it, it, during the game and the board state and maybe you have the uh you have t- you, you need to do some blockings and you uh you you can either choose to play the energy potion and arsenal and pass the turn or just you can uh do some damage uh will, will you choose the priority uh to uh to to just put down an energy potion and pass for uh for a bigger combo turn or you just uh use some use the energy potion to play a spell to re to keep the tempo what do you choose the priority um, more times than anything, I choose to put an energy potion before anything else. There, there are some turns where, for example, if I'm going to have a frostbite and I won't be able to play the energy potion, then you might have to defend differently or can of instant speed. But outside of like a lot of small scenarios, I pretty much energy potion every single possible chance I can get. I see. I understand. And um, Shasha, how do you think uh, the other blue cards, which is uh, good in the deck, Besides, yeah, so besides yeah, besides uh, my favorite energy potion, um, all the other blue cards just do damage. So they're just burn spells. We don't play blue pry. The exception to that is gaze the ages, which kind of doesn't count because you just comes back and you can find another yeah. card. Eye of the Fidia is really up to you for your choice of risk. There were certain games in the Pro Tour where I played Eye of the Fidia, certain games where I didn't play Eye of the Fidia, and there were a lot of factors behind that. But uh, it's definitely not required. Mm. Okay, and yeah, the eyes of Ovidia is uh is a risk to stop your combo. Maybe in your very key turn, oh, I just need to op one card, and oh, there's the eyes. Then oh, just kill it, kill the game. Yeah, yeah, it can uh end your game as much as it can win the game. And uh, Shasha, can you tell us uh what do you think on the key? To playing K notes and how to being a K note player, how to start to play with this hero and learn to play better. That's a loaded question. Uh, I feel like we could talk about this uh, for hours, but um, if I had to put it in a quick sentence, I think the key to knowing how to play K note is understand how you're going to win the game on that final turn. Um, I think it's very very important to know what life total you need your opponent to be out, uh, mm-hmm. what cards you need to be there, how many resources you need to do that. Uh, because otherwise, I think you're gambling a little bit. And um, we're, we, we're wizards. We, we think everything through. We don't gamble uh, that much. <laughs> we have the tactics and the strategy. And That's the it. Campaign. That's it. Yeah, in my mind, maybe uh, if I play with a double with uh, one AB and one crown. I will forecast uh, they can block two in the uh, wildfire. So maybe the maximum uh, buff for my following combo piece will be four, but four. And if I follow a spell just like the lesson lover, then 
just have a seven and they will block one more then just uh you take six then the the blazing i can search then doing a 14 so there is a 4 plus 6 and 14 there's a 24 then the q killing line is the 24 so i just my my plan maybe just uh uh just chip damage to uh life total is 24 oh same then i was saying i i think ah oh, that's the that's the game if i have a right turn right moment i just do the do the killing and is it what you were talking about uh we we have the game plan we know the combo we can do yeah exactly it's just knowing what is the scenario where you can win but mm -hmm. sometimes you have to be a little bit flexible as well like if you're on that game plan the starvo can't use the crown of seeds because if they ever use the crown of seeds then suddenly uh you know you're dealing five more damage and then now it's 29 instead of 24. so and whether your opponent knows that or not is is a different thing which is really interesting Ah. Like uh, there are so many moments where I, I'm just praying. I just need to do one damage, and then the window is there. But they don't know that. It just looks like a blue uh, foreboding bolt. They don't care. Like, uh, but I, I'm I'm praying that I deal the damage. Uh, I see. I see. I understand. Yeah. So, uh, is there any common mistake on playing Kano? You think? Uh, to let uh, new players to avoid or Kano to avoid. Oh, absolutely. I think Kano might be the hardest deck to play. I think there are plenty of common mistakes. The almost too many to list. I think the only way you can get about them is to sit down and play with the character. He, he's super fun, super intricate, and the more you play him, the more your brain realizes, well, I had maybe six different options uh, at each choice throughout the game, and a game could maybe have 30 choices. Like um, that, That's dramatically different. You could play thousands of different scenarios in one single game. Uh, and that's what's really fun about him, I think, as well. So I think the common mistake would be to not experiment and to not try new things. L try new things and losing is perfectly fine. It's only a loss if you don't learn something. Yeah. And other and besides that, uh, it's not a common mistake to uh, the player uh, to to choose to use the Kano ability in the opponent's turn instead of uh, I get the four full hands in doing in my own turn. Do you right. have a thought on doing too much Kano? I, I love Kanoing on my opponent's turn. Like uh, I, I know that it's a, a very common um, conception that you should only Kano on your turn when you have the action point. But I, I love um, Kanoing my opponent's turn because it's on your opponent's turn where you have the most information on what could possibly be left in their hand. So based off the cards that they play and the cards that they pitch, you can kind of deduce what the remaining cards in their hand, whether they're red, whether they're attacks, maybe even to the exact card, to knowing what they plan to put in their arsenal, to put plan for their future turns. So I love playing on my opponent's turn because I feel like there's more agency for me to abuse what information they give me. Mm. So... Um, but that's the thing. Like uh, a lot of the times, uh, I think the rule of thumb is that you don't. But they're being aware of the scenarios where it's correct um, helps you win a lot more games. Yeah. So uh, this also is yeah. When you play more, you gain more experience, and you have some trial and error. You find a white spot to to use the cano or not in your opponent's turn. That's very good. And in the core game plans. Uh, is there any difference uh, if uh, a person to playing a higher AB and uh, in your combo line or just the same? Yeah, absolutely. So if you play with my deck that I uh, built for the Pro Tour, yeah. and which is designed to punish players on AB1 or AB2, mm -hmm. and then they reveal AB3 or more, then the game plan suddenly has to shift. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to do as much as possible is to survive and create a window where they don't have cards in their hand to prevent your combo light. I see. Um, the, thing, the thing out of your control here is how risk tolerant they are. For example, if you play against a, an old time with AB3 and Crown, and all they do all game is hold the cards and just hammer, pass, hammer, pass, um, they're not dealing much damage to you, if any at all. They're actually giving you plenty of time. 
So you can create circumstances to to beat that. And that's where the sideboard comes in. Like an old time is very obvious as a threat that might have higher AB. So you could put in a Stir the Ether Winds or a Cinder in Foresight, which is single-handedly, one of those cards alone is enough to go over the top of any number of AB that it could have. Uh, what's what's more dangerous is like a Starvo that's like full fatigue because you don't know if the Starvo is aggro or control or how many blues they have, stuff like that. So against a Starvo, the only way they deal damage to you is by racing as well. And I think a Starvo has got a lot more red cards too. So that's the other thing. Most decks just always have red cards in them just to beat other decks. So if you plan and wait, maybe depending on what actions they take, you'll be able to find a window where you can deduce in your mind that, okay, based on their actions, uh, I think he's got two red cards in hand. And it doesn't even matter what they have after that. Yeah. Uh, this this needs a lot of uh, practice on that. A lot of practice. Yeah, a lot yeah. of practice. And a good memory. You said good memory is uh, uh, very essential to playing Kano? Uh, not as much, to be honest. Um, I think the only time you need to remember your deck or your opponent's deck is probably old time AB3 in Crown. I think that's probably the only time. But like I said, you can get around that with the Stir the Ether Winds or Cindering Foresight. So there are ways where you, you don't you can go easy mode. You don't have to remember everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're much better. Yeah, much better. Much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Shasha, can you show us your combo piece with the combo line? Uh, most of the time, uh, how many combo line you have to uh, when the opponent to get to the kill zone? So we can kill from 40 uh, very easily with only two cards uh, very easily. So uh, just but it depends. I, I can show you the 40 damage line. It's very, very simple. Oh, okay. So... Yeah. All you need is an Ether Wildfire or Lesson Lava in Arsenal. It doesn't matter which one. And then you just need 14 resources. 14. And the way you're going to 14 resources. The way you're going to get 14 resources is nine in hand by three other blues. You're going to get two more from an energy potion, mm -hmm. which is going to put you at eleven. And the Raga Muffin's hat is mm -hmm. going to turn um, one of the cards in your hand into a blue. So there's a little bit of risk there because the Ragamuffin's hat could get you a red, but yeah. you can mitigate that by having another energy potion, having a tunic counter, stuff like that. I understand. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, less in lava, not blazing ether. Here. Yeah. And and the perfect scenario of the deck is uh, you have the ever wifi in your arsenal, right? And you have a setup on energy potion, and there's a free counter on your tunic. Um, if you, this could get nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So you could be one resource short here still. So there's a little bit of risk to do this forty damage play, but um, if you have two energy potions, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And will you have? Uh, you you can show the the combo first because uh, maybe. We can uh, swap the the ragamuffin and not using the uh, the metacopper snob first, and you can decide after when you draw the card, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you play a card, metacopper snob triggers, and in response to that trigger, you can use ragamuffin. Yeah. But for this combo, you actually don't need to crucible, and you don't need to metacopper snob. It's very very clean. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Then how uh, how to do it? Okay, so you yeah. would pitch a blue to Storm Striders. Pitch a blue and Storm Striders, and we have two floating here. Yeah, and then you just play the Ether Wildfire for four. Straight away. Very simple. No buffs. No buffs. Four. No buffs. Beautiful. Okay, and, and then what you're going to do as well is now we get to Kano twice, and in response... Kano... Kano, Kano. Kano 1 and Kano yep. 2. Both whole priority, yep. not resolve. Whole priority, not resolve. 
Mm-hmm. And this relies on ragamuffins drawing a yellow or a blue. So oh, I know that you put the blazing ether on top, but I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can we can we can shuffle the deck. Sure. What? <laughs> but I, I would only um, go for this line if I know I'm either dead or if I somehow know the top card of my deck. Or, for example, if I have another energy potion in play. Like, that's the other key thing. I would never risk a combo if I think I can go short on resources. Mm-hmm. But this is, like, the fancy way to um, deal 40 damage. Yeah. So we would activate Ragamuffin's Hat, and then we'll draw a blue or a yellow. Oh, that's... Uh... Uh, oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. okay, we find another card. Oh, there's a, there's a blue here. There we go, the right vaulting ball. So, uh, yep, and, and then we put the Lessons of Lava on top. Beautiful. Cool. And then that first Kano will resolve. Yep. And then we get to play this Lesson of Lava. Pitching this blue. Two floating here. Two floating. And this Lesson will come in for seven. Okay. There's a resolve on the fourth damage here. Yep. And here is a three and plus the four. So that's a seven. And then we get to find another lesson of lava. And guess what we're doing? Yeah, and activate the Kano. Kano's already um, coming on, it resolves. We get the lesson and then we just play the lesson again. And you have still have one resource on the left. And yep. there is another seven. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and yeah, after it resolves, and, and we can search another cards. Yep. And this time we're getting the Blazing Ether. Oh, we still have one floating here. Yeah. So there and is, now we'll uh, crack the energy potion. Beautiful. We'll go to three. And then we can activate Kano. And then we'll come in with the blazing ether. Four, 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 and four. So there's a seven plus seven, uh, 14, and uh, 14, 18, 22. Yep, and we just did 18, so this is perfect 40. Okay, there's a 7 here. The 7 and the 4. Oh, there's a 40. Impressive. Yep, that's all you need. Yeah, and still you still have the floating for the, the tunic to the Everwafa. But uh, you cannot uh, sh- make sure uh, the, the cards you, uh, you swap from the, from the head, right? Yeah, there is a way where you can realize if you need to buff the wildfire, but um, it's not really um, required if you know you're dealing 40 and they don't have any resources or anything like that. I see, I understand. But um, yeah, you need to make sure that you either have a blue on top or you've got double energy potion because like you showed, if you draw the red, then you can't do the full 40. I understand, yeah. Yeah, and the combo piece is... Then the combo combo is very amazing, and uh, if you play with the low AB or the aggro that don't have much blue, it's it's just fine. You mostly have a very favorable game in the matchup, and uh, maybe you can talk to us how do you deal with the high AB uh, character just like Odin or the Dash or the uh, the Stavo, which is a uh, they have the slot to have the arcane barrier equipment and the deck is a high ratio of the blue yes so the way you overcome these hyper defensive decks against wizard mm-hmm. is by creating windows rather than dealing damage mm-hmm. so what you need to do is actually threaten more cards on your turn so that they lose cards on their turn and then you can create windows like this um, there are definitely circumstances where you do a lot more than 40. You can do 87. There were some games where I dealt over 100, and that, that's um, 
pretty spectacular. It's a lot of fireworks, but uh, you need to do a little bit of brain power and set those ones up. But um, the thing is, um, the more time you have, the better it is for you. If they're being very defensive, uh, then it's great. Because one thing that once now the deck is public, if there's a card in your arsenal, they can die. And that's a very scary place to be. So um, they can never overextend or overcommit. So th that's the thing to do. It's about creating windows rather than dealing chip damage. Mm -hmm. uh, can I uh, understand in this way? Uh, in the, if they have a higher AB, uh, they mostly play in a defensive way. Uh, way. So we just doing uh, maybe two spell in the round to strip their cards, and you just uh, pitch the pitch the card for some pitch stacking with the combo, just like uh, if you have the, uh, the the Tom of Everwind flowing two blues or just uh, uh, Sonic Boom uh, follow with a Sonic Boom and the Wildfire under with a Everflare and you, you run in a, a cycle, you have the room to uh, use the cycle of the deck, then you can do the combo piece. Yeah, um, that is the hard way to do it. If you mm -hmm. expect high AB, then you can play cards like Centering Foresight or Stow the Ether Winds, where you don't have to think too much. All you do is need a card in the arsenal and maybe an Energy Potion um, if you're playing Centering Foresight. In order to use Stow the Ether Winds, you need three Energy Potions, and that's a lot. But um, that will get you over any ceiling of Alkane Barrier. And if they're being very defensive, they're giving you time. If they're not being very defensive, then they're giving you windows for you to kill them as well. So it's pretty much win-win, other than some outside factors like, for example, you might have to defend or you don't see um, certain cards at the right time. Or on the combo turn, you don't draw many blues, but we play a lot of blues, a lot more blues than normal, so it's uh, much more likely. I see, I understand. So uh, your game plan is uh, not doing the pitch stacking just do the big combo when you uh, gather the, the stir and the, uh, then the fork, right? Yeah, so that's, uh, well, not fork lightning, but um, fork lightning is kind of more of a chip damage card in this deck. But uh, it's more considering foresight or stir the ether winds on the turn where you're going off if you have the energy potions to support it. I see. And uh, so... Uh, and sometimes and you can cheat a little bit. Uh, the, you can cheat the pitch stack by playing the Deja Vu potion. So you don't have to wait. You can just get it whenever you want. I see. Yeah, you have the one uh, Deja Vu in your sideboard. That's all you need. You only need one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much for Shasha today. And uh, I think all of the viewers can get the information and uh, can equip our skills to playing Kano. And thanks to you again, and hope you can uh, doing very well in the coming season of Rising. And we can wait for the new cards and new characters to uh, adapting their meta and playing more Kano. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to see what new tools Kano gets in Uprising. There's a new wizard, so who knows what new stuff he'll get. Yeah, super excited. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for you again. And... Uh, uh, all viewers, we stay safe and uh, stay healthy. And see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.